Hi, it's Rebecca Whitman, your host of the Balanced, Beautiful, and Abundant Show. I'm a top-rated life coach, an international best-selling author, and a multi-passionate entrepreneur. I'm on a mission to help you go from burned out to balanced, beautiful, and abundant. The experts on this show will help you achieve work-life balance so that you can experience abundance in seven pillars of life, spirituality, health, emotions, romance, mindset, social, and financial life. When you have all seven pillars of life in alignment, you are balanced, beautiful, and abundant. Let's go. Hello, Crystal Marco. Welcome to the Balanced, Beautiful, and Abundant show. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. We have been scheduling and rescheduling this, it feels, for like eight months, and it's so exciting that you're finally on the show. I'm so happy to be here. I can't wait to dig in. I know. This is going to be an amazing conversation. Let me tell my audience a little bit about you. So let me get myself going on Instagram. One second. We got to, we're on multiple platforms. I was on story and I wanted to be on Instagram live. So I am, uh, I believe that everything happens in divine timing. And even though we had so many schedules and reschedules, you are here on the perfect day at the perfect time. And we're going to have an amazing conversation. And let me tell my audience about your amazing background. So Crystal Markle, the bossy girl, America's leading, leading expert on servant leadership for women. She has gone through brain surgery to be a survivor, to speak in front of hundreds of people. She's a renowned motivational speaker, a thought leader, an influencer, and a two-time international best-selling author. She has provided leadership development and consulting services for the Discovery Channel, the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs, Planet Fitness, just to name a few. So tell us your story, Crystal. That is uh, very intense that you went from brain surgery to being a motivational speaker. What is what is your story? How did you end up doing the work that you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. It is, it is an intense story, and it's actually... I believe that everything that we walk through, just like you do, is all about divine timing. And I know that I walk through these battles so that I could share them and help others to do the same. So that's why I'm here. I was a leadership consultant and have been a leadership consultant for almost 20 years. And one day I was driving to work in the morning. I was stopped at a red light and I was hit from behind by a truck at 55 miles an hour. As a result, I had a traumatic brain injury and six years ago now, I could no longer read and write. I was having seizures. I was a single mom. I was no longer able to drive. I couldn't um, really function in any way, shape or form to support myself and my daughter. And what happened was I was laying on the couch one day and there's not a single person on earth who would have blamed me at that point if I just decided to stay on the couch. But as I laid there and I was at the time, I was told that the only way I would ever get better is if I stayed in a dark room and I didn't think, which meant no screens, no television, no reading, no music, nothing, just darkness. And I did that for six months and saw little to no improvement. I was still having seizures. I was going unconscious. Um, I was falling down the steps and I was injuring myself even more as I was going through my recovery. So what happened was I was laying there one day and I thought, you know what? Right now I have the opportunity to eat my own cooking. And I recognized my ability to make a choice. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, this could be disastrous or it could be everything. And I decided that I wanted to live. It took me a year and a half, but I enrolled in my master's degree. I got my MBA. It took me longer than it typically takes other people. I still struggle with things like a stutter and memory issues and sometimes some balance problems. 
And I will have, I mean, I am a traumatic brain injury survivor. I have a TBI. I will forever have that. But I made a choice that this journey could either benefit the world or it could take me out of it. And so I have now spent my life working with women like you and others to share this story that every single day we have a choice and this is the way that we can move forward. So that's my story. That's incredible. So the brain injury actually catapulted you into a whole new career where you got your MBA and now you're a leadership expert speaking in front of all these different corporations and empowering women. What, what did you do career-wise before you had the terrible accident? Sure. So, I mean, before my accident, I was a leadership consultant, but mm-hmm. I did not have my own business. I worked for the government. Um, I was the training officer of the largest human services agency in the nation. I had 16,000 employees that I was responsible for. And what happened was I looked around the organization and I realized that there were a lot of people here that cared. There were a lot of people there that um, believed in the mission and wanted to make a difference, but didn't know how to lead. And so I developed a program. It's a year long character and leadership development program that changes people's lives. It changes the way that they interact. And one of the things that happened, I love to tell this story. Um, When I had my accident, I could no longer pay my bills. Um, As a single mom, I had about four months that I could live on my savings. And I thought I was, that would be good. I would be better by then and I could get back to work. And it didn't really turn out that way. And I can remember one day, I didn't know how I was gonna pay my mortgage. And I went to the mailbox and I pulled out the mail and in the mailbox was a letter from a man who said, you don't know me, but I want you to know that you changed my life and you saved my marriage with how you taught us to better communicate. And when I read this letter, and again, I had been doing this at this point for at least 10 years, teaching leadership and character development, which I believe are really one and the same. I had been doing this for a long time and I got this message and and there was a thousand dollar check in in this envelope that allowed me to pay my mortgage. And I felt like it was a divine message to tell me that my journey in this realm is not over, that I still had an opportunity to make a difference. So I went completely out on a limb risked everything and started my own business doing what I had done for many, many years in government, Mm -hmm. but now doing it for myself. And what I did was just essentially blossom. And since that have created success that has really been unparalleled to what I had done before the brain injury, because what also happened was I became somebody that other people could relate to. It was like, wow, your journey isn't perfect. It was never really um, necessary. All the pieces didn't always fit together, but neither does my life. My life feels messy too. And I've walked through stuff that's been hard. And if you did that, maybe I can do it. And it created this message, especially for women that we could connect to and relate to in a way that was uh, next level, beyond what I could share before the accident. And I created a method for how to become, and, and, and now I am called the bossy girl. I was not before the accident. Um, and the story of that was when the doctors told me to sit in the dark. And one day I finally said, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm done listening to you. What you say doesn't work and I'm not doing it. And they looked at me, the doctor, he was a neurologist and he looked at me and he said, well, aren't you bossy? (laughs) And I walked out into the parking lot and I sat in my car and I cried because I thought, oh my word, one more time, I'm just being minimized for having a voice, for being willing to push forward. And I'm being minimized because I... I'm willing to step up and be bold and courageous. 
And I thought, you know what? That's exactly what I'm going to do. You're right. I am bossy. And I'm going to be the bossy girl. And I'm going to make everybody else around me bossy girls. <laughs> so that's how it all started. I noticed that you said that character and leadership are the same thing in your opinion. Can you talk a little bit about that? I absolutely can. One of the things that I've learned especially working in large, large organizations. I still work in large organizations and essentially government, a lot of banking organizations, very highly structured, thousands of employees. And they bring me in to do leadership development and say, you know, can you teach these people how to manage? And to that, what I will say is I can. I can teach management skills, but is that really what you want? Do you want them to be able to manage one another or do you want them to be able to lead? Do you want these leaders to be somebody that others want to follow or have to follow? Which choice is it? And the truth is, if you want to build leaders, if you want to be a leader, and, for, and, and I have to say this too, any situation that there's two or more people, there is a leader involved. And one of the things that I've had to do a lot of in the last six years is speak to women and create an understanding that we are leaders, that this does apply to you. You are a leader. You may not be the top of an organization. You may not be a CEO, but you are a leader, even if it's in your own home, even if it's in your church, if it's in your play group, if it, whatever it happens to be, you are a leader. If there's two or more people, you are there to lead. And being a leader is about who you are, not what you do. Leadership and building followers. It, right? It's not what you do. It's what you say. It's who you are being. It is. And people know. People know. There is no question there's a book and I love it. It's called Blink. And it basically says that people within a fraction of a second make a decision about who you are. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine if you're with somebody for long periods of time, they really have an opinion about who you are. And you may be pretending to be a leader while you're at work. But if your character is not consistent with that, it's not something that they will believe or follow. So leading is essentially equal to character. I love that. So do you think the accident has been the key to your success? Has it been being bossy? What is it that has made you so successful in the last few years since your accident? I will tell you, I, I do think the accident has been a defining moment, but definitely not the key to my success. And the reason that I believe I've walked this path and have been able to share this with other people is because the key to my success is not something that's unique to me. The key to our success is the ability to make a choice. And the most important choice that we can ever choose, in my opinion, and actually I, I think we have four choices, and this is a whole model that I have put together and written about, but we have to have the courage to make a choice. We have to live authentically in who we are. We have to have the grace in order to do that in a way that we can move elegantly in the world. And we have to be willing to choose love. And what love means, and I want to be very, very abundantly clear about this, when I say that we choose love, that does not mean that we necessarily have the emotion that we like everybody and we want to love them. But when we choose love, that means I'm choosing to put your needs over mine, even if I don't like you. Mm. If I'm choosing, if I raise my hand to lead, that means I am the least important person in this room. And it has to always be that way. I think it takes so much humility to be a true leader because they're truly putting other people's needs above their own. And a lot of the greatest leaders in corporations and sports teams, they're not famous. 
because they're they're lifting everyone else up around them and making them look great and they're they're not wanting to take credit and there's so many great leaders that we don't even get to recognize because they're so humble oh rebecca i mean what you're saying is brilliant and it's so true the best leaders are oftentimes invisible and the philosophy that i believe in and teach is servant leadership and the reason that is, is because I had a mentor who was willing to walk with me and push me forward and be willing to be invisible so that I could shine. And I had the opportunity to see what it was like to follow a leader that, that I would walk across hot coals for. That if he said jump, I would say how high. I would not even ask why. And I got to know what that felt like. Most of us have never been led that way. Most of us have never felt that, except for maybe a familial relationship, a mother, a father, um, somebody like that who is willing to sacrifice their lives for you. But most of us don't get to experience that at work. And when you do, something changes. And what I, my message is, is even if you haven't gotten the opportunity to experience that at work, you can be that experience at work, which is amazing. That's that choice. As a leader, you get to choose to go first or not. So who is this mentor? We want to know. People on uh, Instagram are giving you a lot of hearts and everybody wants to know the mentor that changed your life and how you met them and what they taught you. Absolutely. So my mentor's name is John Phillips, and he is the most unassuming man you would ever want to meet. When you see him, he's wearing typically a hockey jersey and jeans and sneakers, and um, he's quiet. He's an introvert, and he has invested his life in creating contribution for others. We all have human needs that matter the most to us. And the most humble people care about contribution. And in his humility, his contribution was building me and others. And one of my favorite things um, to share is that now, John, he was one of the top performance management consultants in our state um, and works for the governor and has since retired and now works with me. So he is still walking this journey and it's an amazing thing because technically he works for me, but I will always work for him and I will follow him to the ends of the earth. That's the one thing you'll always know. If you're leading, people will follow you long after you are in a position of power. If you're truly leading, if you're managing, when the job is over, so is their followership. If you are truly leading, that role never, ever changes. What did you hire him to do? He does the same thing that I do. Yeah, and he's the okay. best. He's, he, he does coaching. A lot of what we do is still strategy and leadership development for large organizations. Strategy is his forte. He tends to be the strategy in the background. I tend to be the forward face that gets everybody on board. Um, and because this would not be his cup of tea. If you ask him to do this, he would say no. Um, he would not be here. But he has all that it takes to actually change people's lives in a way that they will never be, a, be the same. And it's always for the best and in their best interest. And I learned everything I know by watching him. That is so beautiful. Well, yeah. speaking of learning by watching, you shared with me a really heartwarming story before we hit record that I wanted to share with my viewers and listeners. Crystal ran for a public office when I first met her. We met at Blue Talks Columbia University. We were both keynote speakers there. And I just thought she had great energy. She emceed the event and I wanted to stay in touch with her. And right after we met last spring, she started her campaign to run for public office. Uh, what is it? House of Representatives for Pennsylvania? Yeah. 
Yes. yes. And uh, she had a little three-year-old girl, her daughter at the time, Karenna. Yes. And uh, Karenna went with her to knock on every door and was just a part of it. And I was just telling Crystal, you know, what happens age zero through five really forms our personality. So she was modeling for this little three-year-old what it takes to be a female leader. Do you want to share a story or anecdote about that campaign and what it was like to have your three-year-old daughter on your hip the whole time? Oh my word. I have goosebumps as you retell it. It's funny because so often as a single mom, we're just trying to work through things and survive, right? We just have to make it happen. And when I decided to run for office, being a mom is, is who I am, but it's also not something that will stop me from pursuing my purpose and my passion, right? So it was like, okay, now what do I do? What do I do? How do I be a mom and also run a business full-time while running for office full-time? What does that mean and what does that look like? So as you retold it, it was very confirming for me. Okay, yes, I did do the right thing. Um, as I was speaking on courthouse steps, as I was speaking and keynoting at rallies, as I was knocking on doors, these little legs marched beside me everywhere I went. And it was the most beautiful thing because it actually got to the point where at three years old, she was directing me and saying, <laughs> <laughs> mommy you're open let's go where do we go now let's knock this door do you think this person will be happy or do you think they'll yell at you don't worry mommy if they yell at you I'll just smile at them and it will be okay <laughs> and, and it was funny because what I watched happen it was a boldness it was a, 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 a there was a courage that was born in her that she believed that she could do anything. And I have often said she was born bossy. She was born bossy. And when I say bossy, I need everybody to know my mission in life is to redefine the word bossy. Bossy does not mean, if you think about it, the women who are called bossy, and you will never hear a man called bossy, typically. Typically it's women that are called bossy, and typically, it's not really someone who's being nasty. Oftentimes, it's someone who's willing to speak up, someone who's willing to raise their hand, someone who's willing to disagree. Bossy, for me, means courageous love in action. It means being willing to step up for all the right reasons, being willing to think about the mission and make things happen push things forward for all the right reasons, not for me, but for you. And what I saw was my daughter living the philosophy that I created as a result of trauma out loud. And it was confirming for me that I was on the right path. And I have since watched hundreds of women do the same thing. So my heart, it just, it just explodes when I get the opportunity to talk about it. And you didn't win the seat in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, but immediately you talked about all the wins. So why is it so important for people, especially women, not to be scared of failure and that really there is no failure. We either win or we learn. So you either won the House of Representatives seat or you learn and you were just telling me everything you learned. So talk a little bit about not being afraid of failure and how that is also part of being a bossy girl. Rebecca, first of all, I just have to say that is just the most insightful and exciting question because one of the things I didn't share with you is before I even decided to run, there's a couple things that happened. Three times I was asked to run for office and every time I said no. And what we've learned and what I did my research on when I did my thesis was the top qualities of the most influential women in Pennsylvania. What do these women do that the rest of us maybe don't do as well, right? 
And what I learned is that even these most impressive college presidents, people that ran hospitals, they were still struggling with imposter syndrome and they were still wondering if they were good enough to be able to do this job, right? And what happened was when I was asked to run for office, I was told what the numbers were. I knew that failure was imminent, if that makes sense. So I said no. I said no over and over again, which oftentimes we as women do. Unless we can, we know that we will succeed to the nines, we don't do it. We don't do it. We say no, because perfectionism is oftentimes what we see. And these women were no different. But what made them different is that even in the face of failure, they stepped up anyway and gave it a shot, right? So in this situation, what I thought was, you know, at worst case, I lose and I show my daughters that fighting for what you believe in always matters, even if it's an uphill battle. I had literally no shot. The, um, there was never a woman who sat in the seat that I ran for, and there was never anyone from my party who sat in the seat that I ran for. Um, I knew this going into it, but I thought, you know, just because I won't be successful, and, and the other thing that happened is as time marched on, I didn't ever believe that I wouldn't be successful. That's another tip. As we move forward, some people call it delusional confidence, but you manifest your destiny. If you believe you will fail, you will fail. If you believe you will not fail, that will be true too. And what happened was I believed that I would not fail. And in the end, I didn't. I exceeded the numbers that anybody ever expected with a shoestring budget, doing it on my own, I got more votes than, I, I mean, the neighboring districts that had everything going for them and should have won. And I killed it. And my daughters got to drive around the state and say, look, Marie, and they will never, ever forget that. And I did it for the women's rights that mattered to me more than anything. And people got to hear that message and they wouldn't have if I would have been afraid to fail. I love that because women, a lot of women that have not stepped into their power, they, they don't wanna put their voice out there. They have opinions about women's rights or rights or racial equality or, what, whatever um, international politics, whatever's happening, and they don't want to put their voice out there because they want to be judged. But if if there's something that you're passionate about, I'm not saying to be like a blowhard and just share your opinion. Just, but if there's something that's on your heart and you don't say it, you are actually harming people because maybe your message would change their life. Like the person who sent you the thousand dollars, had you not given that seminar, that person's marriage would not have been saved. So by keeping ourselves small and keeping ourselves quiet, we are actually hurting other people. Yes. So what advice would you give women who are afraid? They're afraid to be seen as bossy. They don't want to upset the apple cart. They don't want to be polarizing. Yes. How would you encourage them to step up and be a bossy girl? This is what I always ask. And whenever I'm coaching women, and if that would be something that you would love to do, I would love to talk to you, not you, Rebecca, but anybody or you, it doesn't matter. But um, when we start to talk about how we can make these decisions and being afraid of being called bossy or being polarizing, there's one thing that I always, always ask. And that is, what do you really, really really want? What is your mission? What matters most to you? And once we answer that question, and we can do that together, once we answer that question, it will then script the rest of your decisions. It's super easy. Then you know, when do you speak up? 
When do you raise your hand? There's a reason that grace is a part of the equation of being bossy. Being bossy does not mean that you always speak just to be heard. It means that you speak when it's valuable in the mission that you have created. It means that you weigh your decisions against the outcome that you're seeking. And every day you do that and knowing full well that people may call you bossy. And what happens is when you decide to make this decision within yourself, when you decide that it's okay to be who you are, when you decide that you are worthy of being heard and being loved and loving others, what happens is you no longer are offended. When they call you bossy, your only response is thank you. That's great. Yeah. You know, something funny happened to me. I, I, I don't take myself too seriously. I think one of my superpowers is I'm, I'm into having fun. I love and it. I do really silly reels where I'm dancing, just having fun, being silly, not, not caring what people think. And somebody was like, you know, please stop dancing. And it's someone that, you know, I actually know. And I was like, wow, like me dancing silly is like upsetting to her. And I was like, I'm not dancing because I'm trying to look perfect. I'm just trying to like have fun and be joyous. And I really thought that's interesting because I think women when one woman gets out of line and dances silly or shares her opinion or has, you know, a controversial even look, the other women are like wanting to pull her back in the line. Like she's like, yes. you don't dance anymore online. You're not a good dancer. Like, I don't even think she was being mean. I think she was, I, thought she was being nice. It's, it's women that do that. So women, yeah. It is women, not men. So how, what would you say about that? Why do women, when they think they're actually being nice, pull each other down? What, what is that? Is that like internalized patriarchy? I mean, what, what is your opinion of that? Why do women tell each other not to be bold or silly or stand out or have a voice? You know, and I will tell you, this question is something that plagues me. I researched this even in my thesis to try to find definitively what is the answer to that question. Um, I can tell you when I started running for office, one of my trademarks, and because I'm not at my home office right now, I don't have the background up that I typically do. But even when I'm on Zoom, my trademark is I wear six inch red heels. Yes, I, I noticed that out. when I met you. Yes, you will never see me if I'm speaking or working without a six inch red high heel. And it will even typically be on my Zoom background if you can only see my face. So everyone will associate me with a red high heel, right? When I started running for office, I would go places and I would meet people, specifically women. And they would say things to me like, I know you. I would be like, hi, I'm Crystal. It's nice to meet you. And they'd be like, I know you. And I'd be like, what does that mean? I know you and your red high heels and you can just hear it. It's just like what you got. I know you and your dancing. I know you and that silliness, right? Yeah. We all have a right to this. There's a couple different answers that I have found. And honestly, I cannot definitively answer this question. Yeah. Um, because there isn't ever just one answer to the way that society has impacted every single one of us. But I can tell you, that women have been conditioned to believe that there's only space for so many of us. And that if we encourage other women to shine, that leaves less space for us to excel. This is unfortunate, but it is what society has told us from a very early age. The, uh, and, and as you get up into more experienced women, the more true that that is. So oftentimes those are the women who have raised us. And then we have that thought and we raise other young ladies who believe the same thing. So 
That is a huge factor. We are also biologically engineered where we are competing for the best mate, the best situation. We are still animals by some nature, right? And there's a competition involved here that biologically, again, I can't explain, I'm not a doctor, but I can tell you the doctors say this, that there is a competition involved where we feel like we have to keep other folks down so that we can win. And what we have the opportunity to do is understand that and say, okay, I may be made this way. I do recognize I have these feelings or other people have these feelings. The feelings and emotions we cannot control. That's real. It, the patriarchy has put this in us. Other women have put this in us. And we have the responsibility now to recognize it and then choose behavior that does not represent it. Even if we have the emotions that say that this is true or we have this biological pull to try to make ourselves rise above other women, we must recognize it, feel it, see it, know it, right? And I, another thing that I do is teach diversity and inclusion efforts for large organizations too. And what we do is have real conversations about, this is how I feel. This is what I've been taught about people that are different than me. Feel it, know it, say it. Say it out loud, let's have the conversation. Let's not be politically correct. Let's have the conversation and then we can choose to be something different. I love that. And I would say metaphysically, you know, to quote A Course in Miracles that all words are coming from fear or love. And when wow. someone says something negative about you, whether it's your polarizing opinion, your dancing, your outfit, your six inch heels, whatever, they're not coming from love. They're coming from fear. And I'm paraphrasing it, but the Course in Miracles is like everything is either giving love or a request for love. Yes. So that person coming from fear needs love because if they were completely uh, loving and happy and blissful, they would never say anything negatively. And yes. I would say that love and fear are also likened to abundance and scarcity. And what you were saying, Crystal, of there's not enough, you know, male approval or male resources. That's like cavewoman nature to go around. That yes. is a scarcity mentality, but we get to switch it to an abundance mentality where there, there's, we don't need male resources or approval. We can give ourselves approval. We can go out and earn our own money, create our own food and shelter and our own abundance. Yes. We don't need to have that old cavewoman scarcity mentality around, you know, men and their resources. So yes. that being said, the final question is what does love have to do with leadership? Well, what I would say is everything that you just were talking about, switching this scarcity mindset to this mindset of abundance is exactly what love is all about. It is my ability to choose or your ability to choose that you know what? Even though you're wearing those red high heels, I see what's good in you. And this is the other thing. Being what, like when we share love, that doesn't mean I'm always going to tell you what you want to hear. Right. I may sit down with you, Rebecca, and in private say, I have a concern. I just wondered if when you dance like that on social media, if this could impact your image. Right. Have that conversation. Right. It might be a challenging conversation, but I would do it in private and I would do it with love. Right. And people might do the same thing to me with my red high heels. Hey, yeah. Crystal, you know, people might think you're a bimbo. Let's talk about that. Right. And if you do that in my best interest, that's okay. Right. If you're doing it because you are fearful, that's a whole different ballgame. So love and leadership, to me, are exactly the same thing. 
Love means my willingness to put your needs above mine. Leadership means my willingness to put your needs above mine. The only real difference is in leadership, you're doing it to accomplish a mission. You can never forget that. In leadership, it's about a mission, but the way you do it is the same. The way you do it is the same. I put your needs over mine. Now, please know, especially for women, I always have to add one little caution here. We can oftentimes be very, very selfless. And we can put our own needs for, for shelter, water, food, belonging, to the side and give them to everybody else. So we are pouring from an empty cup and we are burning out and we have nothing left. That is not what I'm talking about. You need to care for you. You are worthy of the time and attention that it takes to fill your cup. And I hope that after you've filled your cup, you can pour from that saucer and think about others' needs before your own so that you're both better in the end. That's what it's all about. I love it. And with that said, that is the whole mission of the podcast is taking women from overworked, stressed out and burned out to balance beautiful and abundant. And that's why we want you to share this podcast with other women to empower them because this conversation was so powerful. If you have a woman in your life that you're friends with, or if you're a guy listening, if you want to empower a woman in your life to step into their leadership, to be the bossy girl that Crystal described, definitely share this podcast with her. So Crystal, how can people stay in touch with you? Absolutely. I would ask you to just go to bossygirl.org. When you go there, you can get everything that you need, whether it's joining our community or reaching out to me for coaching or what is really incredible is I'd love the opportunity to talk to you about building a conversation and a culture of leadership that others want to follow right there in your workplace. That is wonderful. Well, this has been another episode of the Balance Beautiful and Abundant Show. I'm your host, Rebecca Whitman, taking you from burned out to Balance Beautiful and Abundant. Don't forget to give us a five-star review on Spotify or Apple. Share this podcast with your friend and write a review and subscribe. Thanks for listening. And we will back, be back next week with another incredible guest. Until we talk again, don't forget to keep your vibe high and your hands clean. Bye. Bye.